Module 10, Mindfulness, Meditation, Spiritual Practices, and Religiosity. As I've mentioned in previous modules, uh, the use of complementary and alternative uh, interventions for mental health issues has grown significantly. Uh, and their research suggests that the largest increases in use are occurring among women and persons of higher educational and income levels. If you click on the link at the bottom of the slide, you'll be directed to the National Institute of Health webpage um, that talks about the use of complementary and alternative medicine in the US. And interestingly enough, they conducted a study, I believe in 2008, where they looked at uh, the use of CAM and found that I believe something like 38% of adults uh, had used um, complementary and alternative medicine and that number had gone up from their 2002 survey of 36%. <clears throat> so it is being used more and more. Um, it has gained traction, particularly with depression and autism, which we'll talk about in the next module, um, as well as uh, an overall emotional wellness or health approach. So why study this? Um, consumers are driving interest in these approaches. There is some dissatisfaction and high rates of non-response to conventional therapeutic approaches that have also driven the use of CAM, <clears throat> as well as concerns about side effects, particularly with psychopharmacology. And it's important that if you have such a large number of individuals who are utilizing CAM, that we learn more about it. What is it being used for? Um, and what is the evidence regarding their effectiveness? We'll talk about three emerging programs and practice models, mindfulness, meditation, and spiritual practices. And along with that is uh, religiosity. Uh, when we talk about religiosity and spiritual practices, we will also go into conventional therapeutic approaches that have added a spiritual component. So it's important to keep in mind that many of the approaches we're going to talk about today have been in existence for quite a while. Uh, but as I mentioned in module one, that they fall outside of the mainstream of conventional gold standard therapeutic approaches. And so research is really emerging in these areas. So when we think of an emerging practice model, mindfulness has been around, it's an ancient practice. However, it is only recently that it has gained traction in terms of being studied empirically. What is mindfulness? It's defined as attending to the present or the moment to moment. And it's important that we recognize it's not a relaxation exercise, but it's a form of mental training that aims to reduce cognitive vulnerability to reactive modes of mind that might otherwise heighten stress and emotional distress or perpetuate psychopathology. So it's a way to focus or to train the mind to be um, to set boundaries that if stressful events happen um, or if uh, experiences normally would trigger an emotional response, that we have trained our mind to be present focused and not so reactive. There are two pieces to mindfulness, a two-part model. The first is a self-regulation of attention. So it is a trained focus on the present focused or immediate. And then the second is adopting a particular orientation towards one's experiences in that present moment. Um, and that includes having an open-mindedness, um, an orientation that's characterized by being curious and acceptance. There are several models of mindfulness. Uh, Williams, for example, describes a model that results in awareness that includes being attentive to the present, so immediate moments that are occurring both internally and externally. So when we talk about internal focus, it's similar to biofeedback in that we are attentive to our heartbeat, our breathing, um, in order to gain awareness of how our body is in that present moment. 
The second is being more aware of habits to situations and when one is attached or averse. So when there are certain situations that occur, what are we doing internally? Um, what's going on with our body? And the third is responding to events and situations with openness and curiosity. So if any of you are familiar with the cognitive behavioral model, you might be thinking at this point, this might be a good way to interrupt um, distorted thinking because instead of reacting with a distortion um, to an external event or situation, instead you're training yourself to respond in an open and curious uh, way. There are several theoretical tenets of mindfulness including that when we are practicing mindfulness, we want to be present focused. So to focus on the past or the future um, can be detrimental to our emotional health. And that mindfulness changes one's state of consciousness. So things may occur in our environment that we can't control, um, but rather than look into that, we are going to change how we approach um, those situations and again using an open um, open-minded stance in which we are approaching environmental um, situations the theory again behind mindfulness as I alluded to in a couple of slides prior is that we can detach from cognitive distortions or dysfunctional thinking um, by taking this uh, open uh, approach to uh, events that are happening in our environment. Okay. So instead of ascribing a dysfunctional thought to, um, let's say, your car breaks down and you're thinking, you know, this always happens, something always goes wrong. Instead of um, having that thought, in interrupting that cycle, so instead you approach the event in a, uh, a different way. And it's actually proposed to change the brain and brain functioning. Um, the click, uh, the link that you can click on here is uh, directing you to a YouTube video, which is quite brief, but it talks about how uh, mindfulness works within the brain and has the capacity to change how you respond. Um, and this isn't theoretically a stretch. Um, we know that role playing and modeling actually um, also change the brain. So it's really um, a more plastic approach to how we work and our neurology. The human brain is a profoundly complex organ. 90% of its activity occurs beneath conscious awareness, which means that even though we assume that we have some control of how we think, feel and behave, modern science suggests it's not so simple. The concept of neuroplasticity is a new and exciting area of science. It highlights that our brain is constantly being reshaped throughout our lives by both our experiences and our thoughts. We now know that it is the focus of our awareness that determines which brain networks are strengthened and which are weakened or lost. That means that when we get caught up in cycles of worry or irritability, these are the networks within the brain that become stronger. So the more we worry, the better we become at worrying. However, on the other side of this, if we practice being calm, clear and focused, we can strengthen these networks too. As humans, our brain differs from other animals. This is mostly due to the front areas of the brain called the frontal lobes, often called the new brain, as it was the last to develop in our evolution. When well developed, this part of our brain helps us to manage our strong emotions and respond with flexibility, even when we feel overwhelmed. It also helps us to tune in to the feelings of others with empathy and insight. When we feel worried, distracted or stuck on achieving goals, our brain function is more strongly dominated by our old brain, which has a part called the amygdala. The amygdala matches the powerful fight and flight response, which switches on when we feel stressed or anxious and releases hormones and chemicals such as cortisol and adrenaline. That is why stress has such a big impact on us. Mindfulness is a technique that can help us to manage this process more effectively by building our skills of attention, concentration 
and a capacity to direct our awareness in a certain way. This all means that we're less likely to be swept up by a strong emotion and the power of the amygdala. It also means we can bring choice to our emotions and our thoughts. In doing so, we're playing an active role in changing the way the structure of our brain develops, in much the same way we can change the shape of our body by doing certain exercises at the gym. When we practice meditation regularly, we build a capacity to become aware of thinking and emotion. As our mind becomes more settled, our nervous system is able to take in more accurate information, and we can access capacities for creativity, flexibility and lateral thinking, which enable us to manage challenging situations more skillfully. When we build skills of mindfulness, we still experience negative feelings like frustration, disappointment, fear or irritability. But the research shows that we recover much more quickly. We now know from research into brain development that regular meditation and mindfulness practice reduces the size of the amygdala, reduces levels of stress hormones and strengthens connections to the frontal lobes. This all means that we're more likely to live with less stress and more happiness. So this is a very complicated slide that I put in for you to just get an idea of all the ways in which mindfulness can affect the brain. So this slide is informative because there's two TED Talks within it uh, that you can click on and the first is actually how to practice mindfulness and the second is the relationship between mindfulness and emotional health and specifically depression. They're short, uh, but very informative. We live in an incredibly busy world. The, the pace of life is often frantic. Our minds are always busy and we're always doing something. So with that in mind, I'd like you just to take a moment to think, when did you last take any time to do nothing, just 10 minutes, undisturbed. And when I say nothing, I do mean nothing. So that's no emailing, texting, no internet, no TV, no chatting, no eating, no reading, not even sitting there reminiscing about the past or planning for the future, simply doing nothing. I see a lot of very blank faces. <laughs> My thinking is it's probably have to go a long way back. And this is an extraordinary thing, right? We're talking about our mind. The mind, our most valuable and precious resource through which we experience every single moment of our life. The mind that we rely upon to be happy, content, emotionally stable as individuals, and at the same time to be kind and thoughtful and considerate in our relationships with others. This is the same mind that we depend upon to be focused, creative, spontaneous, and to perform at our very best in everything that we do. And yet, we don't take any time out to look after it. In fact, we spend more time looking after our cars, our clothes, and our hair than we... Okay, maybe not our hair, but <laughs> you see where I'm going. The, the result, of course, is that we get stressed. You know, the mind whizzes away like a washing machine going round and round, lots of difficult, confusing emotions. And we don't really kind of know how to deal with that. And the, the sad fact is that we are so distracted that we're no longer present in the world in which we live. We miss out on the things that are most important to us. And the crazy thing is that everybody just assumes, well, that's the way life is, so we just kind of got to get on with it. But that's really not how it has to be. So I was about 11 when I went along to my first meditation class. And trust me, it had all the stereotypes that you can imagine, the sitting cross-legged on the floor, the incense, the herbal tea, the vegetarians, the whole deal. But um, my mom was going, and I was intrigued, so I went along with her. I'd also seen a few kung fu movies, and secretly I kind of thought I might be able to learn how to fly, but I was very young <laughs> at the time, you know. Now, as I was there, you know, I guess like a lot of people, I assumed that it was just 
an aspirin for the mind. You get stressed, you do some meditation. I hadn't really thought that it could be sort of preventative in nature. Until I was about sort of 20, when a number of things happened in my life in quite quick succession, really serious things, which just flipped my life upside down. And all of a sudden, I was inundated with thoughts, inundated with difficult emotions that I didn't know how to cope with. Every time I sort of pushed one down, another one would just sort of pop back up again. It was a really very stressful time. I guess we will deal with stress in different ways. Some people will bury themselves in work, grateful for the, the distraction. Others will turn to their friends, their family, looking for support. Some people hit the bottle, start taking medication. My own way of dealing with it was to become a monk. So I quit my degree. I headed off to the Himalayas. I became a monk, and I started studying meditation. People often ask me you know, what I learned from that time. Well, obviously it changed things. You know? Let's face it. Becoming a celibate monk is going to change a number of things. But it was more than that. You know, it, it taught me, it gave me a greater appreciation and understanding for the present moment. By that, I mean not being lost in thought, not being distracted, not being overwhelmed by difficult emotions, but instead learning how to be in the here and now, how to be mindful, how to be present. I think the present moment is so underrated. It sounds so ordinary. And yet, we spend so little time in the present moment that it's anything but ordinary. There was a, a research paper that came out of Harvard just recently that said, on average, our minds are lost in thought almost 47% of the time. 47%. At the same time, this sort of constant mind wandering is also a direct cause of unhappiness. Now, we're not here for that long anyway. But to spend almost half of our life lost in thought and potentially quite unhappy, I don't know, it's just, it just kind of seems tragic, actually, especially when there's something we can do about it. When there's a, a positive, practical, achievable, scientifically proven technique which allows our mind to be more healthy, to be more mindful and less distracted. And the beauty of it is that even though it kind of need only take about 10 minutes a day, it impacts our entire life. But we need to know how to do it. We need an exercise. We need a framework to learn how to be more mindful. That's essentially what meditation is. It's familiarizing ourselves with the present moment. But we also need to know how to approach it in the right way, to get the best from it. And that's what these are for, in case you've been wondering. Because most people assume... The meditation is all about sort of stopping thoughts, getting rid of emotions, somehow controlling the mind. But actually, it's quite different from that. It's more about sort of stepping back, sort of seeing the thought clearly, witnessing it coming and going, emotions coming and going without judgment, but with a relaxed, focused mind. So for example, right now, if I focus too much, on the balls, then there's no way that I can relax and talk to you at the same time. Equally, if I relax too much talking to you, then there's no way I can focus on the balls. I'm going to drop them. Now, in life and in meditation, there'll be times when the focus becomes a little bit too intense and life starts to feel a bit like this. It's a very uncomfortable way to live life when we get this tight and stressed. At other times, we might take our foot off the gas a little bit too much. And things just become a little bit like this. And of course, in meditation, we're going to end up falling asleep. So we're looking for a balance of focused relaxation where we can allow thoughts to come and go without all the usual involvement. Now, what usually happens when we're learning to be mindful is that we get distracted by a thought. Let's say this is an anxious thought. So everything's going fine, and then we see the anxious thought, and it's like, oh, I didn't realize I was worried about that. You go back to it, repeat it. Oh, I am worried. Oh, I really am worried. Wow, there's so much anxiety. And before we know it, right, we're anxious about feeling anxious. <laughs> you know, this is crazy. We do this all the time, even on an everyday kind of level. If you think about the last time, I don't know, you had a wobbly tooth. You know it's wobbly, and you know that it hurts. But what do you do every 20, 30 seconds? I don't know. Uh, uh, it does hurt. And we reinforce the storyline, right? And we just keep telling ourselves. 
And we do it all the time, and it's only in learning to watch the mind in this way that we can start to let go of those storylines and patterns of mind. But when you sit down and you watch the mind in this way, you might see many different patterns. You might find a mind that's really sort of restless and the whole time. You know, don't be surprised if you feel a bit agitated in your body when you sit down to do nothing and your mind feels like that. You might find a mind that's very sort of dull and boring and it's just almost mechanical. It just sort of seems it's as if you're just sort of getting up, going to work, eat, sleep, get up, up. Uh, or it might just be that one little nagging thought that just goes round and round and round to your mind. Whatever it is, meditation offers the opportunity, the potential to step back and to get a different perspective, to see that things aren't always as they appear. You know, we can't change every little thing that happens to us in life, but we can change the way that we experience it. That's the potential of meditation, of mindfulness. You don't have to burn any incense, and you definitely don't have to sit on the floor. All you need to do is to take 10 minutes out a day to step back, to familiarize yourself with the present moment so that you get to experience a greater sense of focus, calm, and clarity in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've worked in the field of mood disorders for over 30 years and I've witnessed a number of advances in treatments. I've witnessed new generations of antidepressant medications being developed, the use of magnetic coils to stimulate the skull and affect different brain regions, the implantation of electrodes into the brain in regions that are thought to promote recovery from depression, and even the customization of talk therapies to address certain subtypes of depression. But let's face it, the concept of meditation was never high on that list. And there's a good reason for that. The reason is that these are treatments that were developed to alleviate depression, to alleviate the suffering of patients who are trying to get their lives back on track and also to the reduce the capacity for self-harm that is often carried by an untreated and undiagnosed depression. But the, com the complex challenge that depression provides us with is to do more than allow people to let go of symptoms and return into their lives. The complex challenge involves helping people recover from depression and to stay well. What we now understand about depression is that it is a uh, episodic and recurrent disorder. Getting well is half of the problem, staying well is the other half. And this is really where my work in the area started. I was tasked with addressing the problem of relapse and its prevention. And I was um, a card-carrying member of cognitive therapy uh, group working in an outpatient clinic at a hospital. Um, my work was quite distant from meditation and other contemplative practices. I received a small grant from the MacArthur Foundation to try to modify an existing treatment for depression so that it could prevent relapse. And um, what I did with that money was to bring together two colleagues of mine, Mark Williams, who is at Oxford, and John Teasdale, who is now at Cambridge. And we sat together and thought about how would we go ahead and do this, modify this treatment, provide something to people who are in recovery to help them stay well. We kind of hit the pause button because we didn't want to take a treatment that was designed to help people come out of depression and just continue to sort of spool it forward to people in recovery. We wanted to understand if there were specific risk factors, specific triggers that helped um, people who were in recovery get depressed and maybe see whether we could design a treatment around those specific triggers to try to undo their sort of pathological influence. The really cool thing about working with Mark and John is that they had done seminal work in the area of mood-dependent memory, the way in which moods and thoughts come together and influence each other, bringing moods that are negative to mind much more easily if one is thinking um, in a depressive way, and depressive thoughts uh, bringing moods together that are depressed more easily. One of the things that we found was that when people are depressed, and they're feeling sad, this is a symptom. 
But when they're no longer feeling depressed, sadness can function as an important context to bring to mind judgmental, critical, and harsh ways of viewing the self that can sometimes tip people over into a new episode of depression and cause a relapse. And so we stood back and thought to ourselves, what if we could, um, first of all, test out this model? What if we could find a way to modify this effect that sadness has on mood and memory? And then what if we could teach this to people? Wouldn't it be possible that this would be a more efficient and a more direct way of helping people stay well? And it happened that um, our theory led to a model and very supportive data for our conjectures. People who were well, had recovered from depression, had been treated, but were experimentally induced into a brief state of sadness, found that they could very easily start to recall experiences from depression, and that the folks who did that the most were the ones that had the highest rates of relapse when we followed them for 18 months. We had some very important evidence here that suggested that our model had legs that the ability to work with sadness in people that had recovered from depression may determine whether they're able to go on and sustain the benefits of treatment or whether they're going to relapse. But how do you work with a trigger of relapse like sadness when sadness is also a feature of our universal human experience? We weren't interested in trying to eliminate sadness. We weren't interested in trying to get people not to feel sad. What we really needed to do was to help people develop a different relationship to their sadness. And what does that mean in terms of trying to teach people certain skills? This is really the point at which mindfulness comes into the picture. Mindfulness is really the awareness that comes to mind, the awareness that arises when we pay attention in a particular way. We're bringing our attention into the present moment and we're not judging what we notice. So, purposely attending to the present moment without judgment. Turns out this is a very useful skill to have because it can reveal aspects of our experience that have already been and are continuing to be present for us, but we're just not able to access them. We're not focusing on them. Let me just stop for a second because words have a sort of limited utility when you're talking about mindfulness, and let's see whether we can have a chance to experience this directly. If you're willing, maybe just Pause for a sec, make yourselves comfortable in your chairs, and start by thinking about your feet. See if you can just do that. Just let your mind start thinking about your feet. How your feet have carried you a fair distance today, where they've taken you, walking, driving, sitting. Maybe comparing one foot to the other. Noticing any judgments or evaluations. Seeing whether you like one foot or the other foot. Seeing whether there are any worries about your feet. Any things that are medically oriented or undescribed sensations. Whether you have any future oriented things relating to your feet, like maybe you've got a pedicure that's scheduled or you need to redo your toenail polish. Continuing to think about your feet and just letting whatever comes up in your mind be there. Just thinking about your feet. And then stopping and now redirecting your attention and taking your attention back to the feet, but this time just becoming aware of whatever sensations are present in this part of your body. So maybe feeling the way the feet are pressing down against the floor through the soles of your shoes. Perhaps feeling the points of contact for the big toe, the little toe, the heel, the ball of the foot. Noticing any sensations between the toes, any moisture, any heat. Even the foot itself encased in the shoe any sense of tightness, pressure, throbbing, and just allowing whatever sensations come to mind as you're 
experiencing your feet in this way. And then stopping, pausing, and looking for a moment at these two different ways of having an experience of your feet. Thinking about your feet, directly experiencing your feet. The practice of mindfulness allows you to take all of this information into account. Allows you to be focused on directly feeling what you're going through as well as having or noticing thoughts about the experience as well. And this, we felt at the time, was an answer to the question of how can people work with sadness, not by eliminating it, but by being able to have a different relationship to it. We've used a fairly mundane example of feet, but what happens if we try to tune this into sadness when it's present, negative emotions when they're present? And thankfully, at the same time that we were doing this, we were aware of John Kabat-Zinn's pioneering work with mindfulness meditation with patients that had chronic pain. He was doing this very thing. People who had chronic pain training themselves to attend to the sensations of physical discomfort. Not pushing pain away, but finding a way into their physical discomfort that allowed them to see more room and more space inside it than simply thinking about it, than trying to worry about it, trying to eliminate it, trying to distract themselves from it being present with it, and he was showing remarkable outcomes that more and more of these people's lives could be reclaimed and that the chronic pain features of their lives became less and less of a primary concern. And so what we tried to do was to develop the same training program for people who had recovered from depression based on his seminal eight-week program, which he developed, much of which featured extensive training in mindfulness meditation, mindful movement, and we also added in bits and pieces that were relevant to living with a depressive disorder. And we called it mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, it became manualized, it became evaluated, and it had very little of the baggage associated with contemplative meditative practices. You didn't have to enter the world of meditation. I dressed like this, I didn't wear robes when I came into a class. And open the door as wide as possible for people to see this as a very pragmatic health practice for regulating emotions. This wasn't about finding God. This wasn't about transcending reality. This was about learning how to harness attention in the agenda of self-care. Now, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy essentially tries to work starting with um, concrete examples of how to pay attention and how to be mindful um, we did this with the feet. We start in our course with raisins, with eating, with breathing, with other kinds of activities, and eventually work our way up to dealing with negative emotions. And what we're trying to get people to do is to anchor themselves in their experience so that when a negative emotion comes up in the mind, it can wash over them. It doesn't totally destabilize them, neither does it necessarily bring to mind all of the negative associations that for some people can ve happen very automatically. Instead, they can find a different place for standing and working with these feelings, and as a result, have much more of a option for selecting a response and influencing what happens next. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy has performed um, very well in clinical randomized trials. About a thousand patients have been evaluated using this approach across seven studies worldwide. And what we're finding is that compared to usual care, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy reduces relapse by about 43%. And compared to antidepressant medication, it provides equal protection against relapse as continuing on an antidepressant for long periods of time. The other positive thing about this treatment is that it enhances people's ability to feel reward and to feel positive affect, positive emotions in the course of their everyday lives, which is vital because this is a tough sell for many patients, for many people with depression who are feeling well and feeling as if their depression is behind them. They don't need to continue to engage in ways of looking after themselves. Why should they invest the time and space and often very busy lives for doing this? The capacity to reward and to feel reinforced for practicing mindfulness allows these 
um, health benefits to continue. And another way in which we know that these health benefits can get locked in is the fact that mindfulness also changes the brain. It changes the brain in very meaningful ways by allowing people to access what's been called the present moment pathway. Now, on the face of it, it makes sense. We're training people to pay attention to the present moment, so maybe there's some parts of the brain that get tuned up to be able to do this. But we've got some fairly um, good data to suggest that part of this present moment pathway, um, the region that is very active in training uh, in mindfulness is the insula. And the insula is a part of the brain on a network that allows signals from the body to be more um, carefully attuned. Signals of present moment, sensations, what's happening in the body in this moment, not thinking about the body, but right now, sensations. And people are better able to tune into the state of the body by doing this. And what we're finding is that um, as the present moment pathway gets activated, people that have been trained in mindfulness are able to really increase the activation in the insula more than people that haven't been trained. So mindfulness trains awareness in this present moment pathway. And it turns out this is vitally important for working with sad mood states. So what happens if you put someone into an fMRI scanner and induce a mild state of sadness and they haven't had training in mindfulness, they will um, activate a part of the brain called the um, executive control network, which is sort of like the thinking about your feet network, if you want a network of brain regions that are involved with evaluating. What do I need to do about this sadness? Is this sadness relevant to me? Is this a threat? How can I problem solve it? How can I eliminate it? And so you're thinking and thinking and thinking about sadness. And what happens is, as that network is stronger, the present moment pathway gets weaker. So one is stronger, one is weaker, and you're getting very little signal from what's happening in your body, how this emotion is actually impacting you in this moment. And you're getting a lot more about the conceptual workings of the mind around what is sadness, what do I need to do about it, what else is it sort of calling to mind. Now, after people have been trained in mindfulness, you're getting this rebalancing between um, both networks coming online. Executive control network gets inhibited a little bit. The present moment pathway increases its activation a little bit. And now the person feeling sad has access to two channels of information, a channel of information about the meaning of sadness, but also a channel of information about the present moment state of the body that is working with sensations of sadness. And both of these channels of information can lead to more effective responses and selections of activities in terms of dealing with sadness. This is a movement away from a kind of automatic activation of the previous contents um, that would be brought to mind when sadness was present and a widening into a much more spacious view of sadness and the choicefulness that comes with that. And what we find in our work is that a treatment is eight weeks in length and yet we're asking people to take this on board as a way of continuing to look after themselves. About 75 to 80 percent of our patients um, continue some form of mindfulness practice for about um, a year, two to three years afterwards. And what happens is that although the portal that brought them into us in the first place had to do with a disorder, depression, had to do with getting treatment, more and more people recognize that through the practice of mindfulness, they are able to connect with an inner resource that allows them to take care of themselves in a way that touches greater moments of wholeness in their days and allows us to permeate more moments of their lives as they go forward. It becomes less about a treatment. It becomes more about a way of life in looking after themselves. And this has really been the um, pinnacle of the work that we've conducted to move from a juxtaposition of two approaches for depression that seemed seemingly unconnected into developing a coherent and empirically supported way of delivering this type of care and allowing people to take over once the course is over. Thanks very much for your time. We're going to talk about one form of uh, one intervention that has mindfulness at the forefront. As uh, a couple of slides back, 
mindfulness is incorporated within several therapeutic approaches, such as dialectical behavior therapy <coughs> as a core component. But this approach, it's an eight to 10 week group. Um, sessions are about two and a half hours in length. And each session covers particular exercises and topics that are examined within the context of mindfulness. And you have a reading on this, so I'm not going to go too much in detail. But this, is, this intervention actually has been studied empirically. These are the theories behind it. Um, so it draws from a cognitive model. And what it encourages is responding to dysfunctional thinking in an open and non-judgmental way. So you're interrupting the pattern between event or situation and dysfunctional thought, which if you recall from the cognitive model or triad, it is the um, distress comes out of our thinking. So um, you're interrupting event from thought with the goal of then um, reducing distress. Okay. Also, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, that focus on internal distress um, and internal functioning is important for anxiety specifically. So being aware of the physiological changes in your body um, is helpful in order to then uh, respond with coping strategies. So predicting the event or situation that causes anxiety, understanding your um, response to that, and using mindfulness can interrupt that pattern as well. We're gonna move on to meditation, and mindfulness is a form of meditation, and there are over 20 types of meditation. Um, it's defined as engaging in mental exercise, uh, and that may include repeating a phrase. Um, there's, again, 20 different types. You could do Zen meditation, you're seated on the floor in a half lotus position. Mantra meditation is re repeating a syllable or word or chakra. Um, focused attention meditation is focusing on an object. So. Mindfulness is under the umbrella of meditation, and because of such, uh, meditation is, again, a very present-focused um, way in which we can interrupt um, distress or decrease distress by um, our approach to <coughs> um, external stimuli and events. So as I mentioned before, um, their uh, mindfulness and meditation are included in um, several treatments that have had uh, much empirical study, including dialectical behavior therapy, which is a treatment for emotional regulation difficulties, as well as cognitive therapy, and there's mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy. This is a great TED Talk on how veterans have been using meditation to decrease symptoms <clears throat> associated with trauma and PTSD. It's about 11 minutes in length. <clears throat>
Hypervigilance. It's where all your senses are operating at full speed, collecting data and visuals. And to a degree, you even learn to use your intuition. There is no training to turn this off. So back home, I was just as alert as I ever was over there. In restaurants, I'd sit facing the entrance, having already scanned the room to get a baseline of threats. I've identified all the improvised weapons near me and how I would react to the various ambush scenarios in my mind. Now let's have dinner. <laughs> Notice I didn't say let's enjoy dinner. There's not a lot of joy in a veteran's life with PTSD. However, hypervigilance was just part of my PTSD. Nightmares kept me up most of the night, which kept me exhausted. I would relive the events throughout the day in my mind, raising my heart rate, anxiety, and blood pressure. This would often then leave me very agitated, angry, or distant. Not very fun to be around for long periods of time, which is why I chose to be alone a lot. It was easier that way. In large groups such as this, I feel like a target because I cannot control the situation. My anxiety level is high because I am alone. Even up here in front of all of you or sitting next to family and friends, I feel alone. You see, back in the day, I had my brothers with me, and they were just as alert and well-armed as I was. We were in it together. Brothers till you fall. And fall, some of them did. But no one gets left behind, we'd say, as if that's supposed to help. There was strength in numbers, and now I'm by myself, waiting on a fight that never comes. As a veteran, I'm haunted 24 hours a day, seven days a week by my PTSD. Loud noises, car accidents, or any number of triggers causes me to relive those days again. Exhausted, the experience seems so vivid, only confusing things further. Being trained to expect the unexpected with no way to turn off the obsession left me emotionally numb. Exhaustion. Well, that's standard government issue in the military, along with fatigues and a rifle. Typically, though, I'm just as exhausted back home as I ever was over there. Being so tired makes thinking and good decisions very hard to do, leaving you looking for any type of relief. Sadly, the easiest thing to obtain is alcohol, and I found myself drinking alcohol before bed in the hopes of getting a few hours of sleep. A doctor once did a cortisol test on me, and she was shocked to find that my highest levels of stress were in the hours before bed. This did not shock me, however, because if you think about it, I was trained to believe that someone is always trying to kill me. So feeling alone and closing my eyes is not an easy thing to do. And when this goes on long enough, my body started to break down due to my stress, exhaustion, and bad habits. Stress-related illnesses like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel brought me physical pain to go along with my emotional pain that I pretended did not exist. I've had shingles 17 times. Some of you know that intense pain, and you'll know most people get it once or twice, but not me. In August of 2011, my body started to break down in a really bad way. The VA did a massive work upon me to try to figure out what was going on. It hurt to walk, move, sleep, or think. I had lost interest in living if I was going to live like this, and I was okay with dying. I truly was considering my mortality because I wanted the pain to end one way or another. The shocking part to this, it was easy to have these thoughts. In fact, America has an ongoing veteran suicide crisis where 22 soldiers, 22 veterans, will commit suicide today. 22 veterans will commit suicide tomorrow and each day. Over 8,000 veterans a year. I have known some of them. And while I don't know what that final thing was that put them over the edge, I can imagine it's not very different from my story. This cycle has to end. And it seems society is concerned about veteran suicide awareness, but with no solutions. 
Think about it this way. If 22 soldiers were killed today, it would be all over the news, and the public would be calling for airstrikes and retaliation. It's easy to see how a veteran can feel alone and forgotten when he goes to the VA with PTSD and all he gets is pills to numb the pain. However, I was lucky enough to see any type of doctor I could afford. Western, Eastern, Indian, alternative medicine. And I will tell you what I found that helped me the most. It's simple, really. In February of 2015, I went to a holistic medical retreat to try to see if I could reset my body and health using an ancient Indian way of medicine called Ayurveda. And part of this seminar was regular yoga and meditation sessions. And being me, I was extremely apprehensive about doing such activities. But I was looking for any type of relief. And so I bought the biggest yoga mat I could find and tried as hard as I could. The results are just that funny. <laughs> Most people were stretching and enjoying the workout, and I'm in the corner having visions of Braveheart sweating and moaning. Inside, I felt meditation might be another failure. But during my first guided meditation, something dramatic happened. I felt my body actually relax. And I was in a place between thoughts. My mind quieted, and it felt really good. I was able to see and process my memories for being just that, memories. As the session ended, I sobbed because I had no idea what was happening to my body. But I, know, I knew that I wanted that feeling back. And so I meditated again before bed, fell asleep during the session, slept hard, no nightmares even, and woke up actually feeling refreshed. Back home, I continued my meditation, and things continued to improve. Others noticed a difference in my attitude and demeanor at work and asked what changed. My answer? Meditation. Intrigued by my progress, I decided to do some research on PTSD and meditation and found several recent medical studies confirming what my heart already knew. Meditation lowers stress and anxiety levels, improves immune function, and lowers heart rate and blood pressure. Upon conclusion of one of these studies, veterans confirmed that they were continuing to practice daily meditation and reported feeling calmer, less stressed, deeply rested, and finally more engaged in their daily lives and family. Encouraged by these reports, I saw a huge opportunity to help veterans with PTSD. So in keeping, keeping with the soldier's mantra, no one gets left behind. Eight months ago, I started a nonprofit to raise money and send veterans with PTSD to learn and practice meditation like I have. And this is where I need your help. Will you help me find these brave men and women? Encourage them to contact us because one month ago in early October, we had five veterans come together from across the country and go through an all expenses paid four day meditation seminar. And the results were truly life changing. Words will not do justice to what happened. They were relaxed. They were smiling. They were joking, sleeping without medication, and starting to enjoy their life again. Now, the best part about this is we've raised enough money to send 10 more veterans very soon. But our work has just begun. With your help, we will continue to raise awareness so that any veteran with PTSD can find peace from the haunting scars of war. Thank you. Moving on to spirituality and religiosity. So, Religious uh, beliefs and spirituality have had somewhat of a uh, conflictual relationship with mental health treatment. And it was the mental health field once viewed it as pathological. But we are increasingly recognizing the value and the importance of religious affiliation and spirituality in mental health wellness. 
Um, anecdotally and research suggests that um, religion and having a spiritual center can be helpful to cope with stress and for um, enhance emotional wellness. So there's evidence that's coming out that suggests that there are potentially therapeutic effects associated with religion, religion and having a spiritual foundation. There is a subtle but important distinction between spirituality and religiosity. So religion is conceptualized as a structured, organized, uh, socially based construct that has an associated uh, belief system, um, cultural traditions within it, ritual ceremonies. Usually there's a connection to a higher power. Spirituality is different. It's seen as the individual's connectedness or sense of belonging with a greater whole or something bigger than themselves. It's uh, usually a personal path that someone will take towards understanding life and meaning. It can be expressed through religion, but also through other media, such as art, music, and writing. This is a local TED Talk uh, that was given by Dr. Lisa Miller about depression and spiritual awakening. And it's about 15 minutes long, but it is um, research informed uh, that lends meaning to depression and to spir uh, spirituality. So finding a spiritual path and how that can be uh, a buffer against depression. In the dark of the night, 4 a.m., I look over and my husband's not there. I look further and I find him flat on his back, looking at the ceiling, arms out. Our lives are hollow and meaningless without children. It had been two and a half years of hopes and prayers and failed fertility treatments. No one had come. And the despair that ripped through our hearts woke us night after night to the point where friends and family called just to see how we were doing because we so clearly were depressed. As a clinical psychologist and scientist, I had been trained to see that depression is a disease. Much like cancer or diabetes, depression as a disease had symptoms of despair and isolation. And yet that simply did not explain the road we were traveling, nor did it explain the depression that follows loss of a spouse, miscarriage, trauma, or the natural transitions, sophomore slump, midlife crisis, portholes and passages, chapter breaks that seemed core to who we are, were not aberrant, illness, they were not disease. And so my husband and I continued with each cycle ending in a disappointment that felt like a funeral. And as we continued down our road of trials, we started ever so gradually over months and years to open our eyes from a dark and isolated place, quite alone, to a place where we started to hear the guidance of helpers and healers, the folks who on the Appalachian Trail through hikers call trail angels for bringing food and water when they need it most. Our trail angels brought what we needed most, wisdom and guidance. So one day I came home after yet another in vitro with the haunting feeling as I drove my car that this too was a failure. And sure enough, as I stepped to the door, the evidence was incontrovertible. A tiny dead duck embryo lay on my threshold. And I knew it was not possible that the embryo in me was alive. And so I went to bed and had a long depressing nap 
to a wake, to a duck, the mama duck who'd lost her aspirational baby. And the mama duck was persistent. I thought, what would the duck want with me? She wanted to come towards me. And as I opened the door, I saw she'd brought me a gift, the most precious thing in the world to her. She'd brought me a plump, juicy worm. Mama duck and I, there we were, two aspirational mothers, not alone. Not alone because duck and I were side by side and not alone because of the great force that brought duck. And so too, through that force came the guy on the bus. And the guy on the bus winked, and leaned over and said, you seem like just that type of mother that would go all around the world adopting all types of kids, opening up that new possibility. Listening to the helpers and healers opened my awareness so that the next time I was woken in the night was not by the rip of depression, but by a great and clearly sacred presence, a presence with a love so great and a gravitas that I sat up. And the presence said, if you were pregnant, would you adopt? And I said to something so awesome and great, the truth, which was no. But I also knew that this journey was more than a disease. <laughs> and that this depression was opening a door on a path of becoming a spiritual path. Continuing down this path, I wanted that baby. <laughs> It was great that I was on a spiritual path, but I wanted that baby. And so we didn't quit. Up and down the East Coast, the best IVF labs in the country, we went so far as to find the team that invented IVF. And sitting there in solidarity on bed rest with my spouse, we found that the remote was stuck in our, in our hotel room on one channel. One interminable documentary, four hours <laughs> of a little boy. A little boy who stood in a garbage dump alone and said, I don't care that I'm poor. I don't care that I can't go to school. But it hurts so much to not be loved that I sniff glue to make the pain go away. And lying there on our multiple round of IVF, my husband and I looked at each other and he said at first, we knew there was a child out there for us. We made our way to a wise woman and hovered round her table, the daughter of a once clergyman. She looked at us and said, frankly, what is it that you are looking for in your child? And I leaned in and said, well, I don't care if this is a boy or a girl. I don't care what race this child is. Just please, a child who can love. And my husband jumped in and said, well, yes, all that, but kind of a girl. <laughs> <laughs> what we knew in common was that the voice that said you will never be parents, the voice that came from being alone in darkness, was now a voice that said, parenting is love. It hurts so much to not be loved. All he wanted was a mom. All I wanted was a child. What would have made us family was love. Parenting was love. This was depression as a portal to a world of connection, a world of love, a world in which we walk a spiritual path. This was depression as only one side of the door. And on the other door was illumination, warmth, light, and spiritual path, spiritual passage. Now, as a clinical scientist, it was clear to me that anything true through yet another human lens of knowing can be again shown. 
the certainty I had that depression and spirituality are two sides of one door seemed well within reach of science. And so my lab, together with that of Myrna Weissman and Brad Peterson and Ravi Bansell, did the science. Two sides of one door. Where is it in the brain? Where is depression as the porthole of the spiritual path? Not the disease. And we found it. And we found it in broad and pervasive regions of the cortex. We welcomed into our lab deeply depressed people from families loaded up with generations of depression and similar people with families loaded up with generations of depression who through their journey of suffering had reached a foundationally spiritual path. People whose lead foot was now depression for having traveled the darkness. And what we found was that in precisely those regions of the brain, which atrophied and withered in lifelong depression, for those people with a strong personal spirituality, there was a thickening of those very same regions. The cortex was thick as if you were looking at a tree in the Amazon versus a tree withering under the cold and drought. Two sides of one door is in us. Depression is not always an illness. It can be. We can need to be rebooted or recalibrated or medicated. It can be. But very often, depression, as everyone will face it, is core to our endowment and core to our development. My husband and I continued now with this knowledge that we were on the spiritual path in search of our child. It was clear that our suffering was not for naught. It was not an empty symptom. And with the awareness that we were becoming, the presence came back. And the presence asked the same question in a deep and profound way. And my answer was honest, which is, I am getting there. I can feel we're down the road. There is the possibility of spiritually evolving into the person who would answer yes, but no, I'm not quite there where I would still adopt a child if I were pregnant. My love has grown, but is my love that great? Not yet. And so we continued and I found myself in the community of those who for generations have known that depression is but one side of the door and spiritual awakening the other. Seated on the floor of the Anipi, the sweat lodge, among the Lakota in South Dakota, I joined the circle of women. And here each woman talked about the suffering which had brought her to our collective prayer. My son, he's 40. He's not come home to his family. My son, he's 14, and he's starting to use substance. And I, in turn, shared that I was searching for my spiritual child. Together we prayed and we sent it up. We sent our prayer both for one another, ourselves, and the collective up to Great Spirit, Wananichi. That night, a call came. They'd found him. That very night, on the other side of the earth. We have found the Miller's child, was the message. They're great girls, and we can sure find you a girl. But this is the Miller's child, and this is a son. Well, this time, clinical science had something to say to the spiritual path. When we looked at the women who through suffering had come to a spiritual path with nice thick cortexes, they also had another quality. The back of their head gave off a certain wavelength of energy that we call alpha. And it's also found on the back of the head of a meditating monk. Alpha has another name. It's Schumann's constant. It's the wavelength that the earth's crossed. The spiritually engaged brain vibrates at the frequency of the earth's crust. From the Anipi across the globe was found Isaiah. In through this matrix of consciousness, love, this sacred field that is in us, through us, around us, and covers all living earth. This is the world in which we live. A world in which we're never alone, in which there is guidance, trail angels, helpers, and healers. And through the field of love comes just the person 
the guy on the bus, the medicine woman, just that living being, the duck, the wise, generous animals, our sisters and brothers. And in fact, we can no longer begin to think that we are actors on an inert stage, but that the world is alive and infused with that sacred field we might measure as high amplitude alpha. Knowing this, we live into an inspired life, a life of meaning that is not one that we create, but meaning that is truly in the fabric of the world. We live an inspired life. Isaiah, had, my son had been found, named Isaiah for one world, Lakota, for those who helped find him. And yet we still, although far less depressed and much more full of love and connection, had the anxiety of actually meeting him, finding him, bringing him home. And then one day the FedEx came and we peeled it open and there was the video. We popped it in and the most joyous little boy, full of happiness, arm around the nurse, <laughs> a love like I had never felt lifted me up and any remnant of depression were shards on the ground. And together, my husband and I went to bed as parents. That night, the presence came back, the great sacred presence for the third time. If you were pregnant now, would you adopt? Yes, I found my spiritual son, yes. And that night, we conceived naturally. His sister. We had spiritual twins. So when you hear the knock, consider the invitation. What sounds shocking and as if the hand that takes from inside the darkness, when we walk through the door is the hand that invites that guides and ultimately gives. On the other side of the door is the inspired life brought to us by the presence. Thanks. As I mentioned prior, um, some um, religious components have been integrated within therapeutic approaches that are conventional, such as cognitive behavioral therapy. You have a reading on this, but um, CBT is in its standard form delivered, but incorporates religious beliefs uh, through using actually potentially dysfunctional thinking that's based on religion or religious thinking. Um, also using and bringing in um, religious materials in order to challenge negative thinking and ultimately using religious behavior such as prayer and other traditions and rituals to combat depression. Critically appraising the evidence. So mindfulness has been correlated with reducing depression and anxiety and enhancing emotional wellness, specifically mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, Grossman's meta-analysis actually looked at this and found within the study, so there were approximately 20 studies included in that meta-analysis, um, found a significant relationship between uh, mental health outcomes such as depression, anxiety, and um, the approach. Notably, and something to consider when you are reviewing the evidence, is that uh, a large number of studies that were focused on MSR, MBSR, excuse me, um, were excluded from that meta-analysis because of methodological or statistical issues. So that really calls into um, question what we can really say about this approach and that there might be a lot of benefit to mindfulness-based stress reduction that we're not aware of because it wasn't uh, the approach was not evaluated in a rigorous way or one that met Grossman's criteria. Additionally, we found that incorporation of an individual's religious background is more effective than conventional therapeutic approaches that don't, do not address um, spirituality or religion. And if you um, 
have been a clinician in the field for a while um, and you have conducted biopsychosocial assessments, there's been a real shift or incorporation of the individual's um, religious affiliation and beliefs. Um, religious uh, CBT, so that approach where um, that we just spoke about, religious integrated uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, has shown in Koenig's article to be uh, significantly associated with attendance and outcomes. However, it wasn't for the entire sample. It was among the more religious individuals. And there's uh, upcoming research that's looking at the impact or comparative effectiveness of religious integrated CBT in comparison to um, mainstay conventional treatments for um, <clears throat> depression. So that's up and coming and encouraging because we need more rigorous research in order to discern the benefits of these approaches. Not all the evidence is in favor of these approaches and you have two articles that attest to that. I do want to make a note that um, as you recall from the earlier modules where we spoke about levels of evidence, if you have mixed or contrary results, that lowers the level of evidence. Um, and so that's definitely a consideration. Also keep in mind that Burke's article is a perfect example of where the field is moving. We're looking more now at biomarkers, stress hormones, mechanisms of change. So cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, is a highly effective treatment for depression. Why is that? Um, so as these studies um, become more popular, you might very well see amendments or revisions to conventional therapeutic approaches um, in terms of their, theor their theory and their proposed mechanisms of change. So instead of um, even cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a lot we don't know. So we can theorize that um, depression is, um, the, a depressive episode is um, brought about by dysfunctional thinking to external stimuli or some external event and that the root of it are these dysfunctional thoughts or schemas. But even back, if you read on cognitive behavioral theory um, or interpersonal psychotherapy, there's still those basic biological and psychological processes that we don't have a, a clear understanding about as they contribute to the onset of mental health problems. So the short um, story there is that it's important that we now pay attention to physiological, neurological um, factors as explaining why a given intervention is potentially effective. If we look back as to how do these innovative models and practices address gaps in current treatment, um, there's a couple of ways in which this occurs. The first is that um, religion and again, spirituality are core components of many individuals. Um, and so to not address them is, um, would not you know, consider the whole individual. And it might actually affect the relationship between the client and the therapist if they feel that they're not addressing their religious beliefs or at least acknowledging them. Um, and as we saw for RCBT, um, there's a certain segment of the population in which it's um, actually more important that you address these issues um, uh, because it can enhance outcomes. We also know that these practices are becoming embedded within or they are already part of larger interventions. And it may be that using mindfulness as a main component of a uh, therapeutic model that, cons that has multiple components may be more effective um, than just that standard conventional intervention. And this really falls within the larger model of patient-centered care. So patient-centered care is um, growing in popularity as a way to be responsive to the individual instead of a one-size-fits-all approach. As we know from other therapeutic approaches, there's a large segment of the population that just does not benefit from conventional treatments. So maybe we need to start looking at this from an individualized perspective. 
We also need to be mindful of ethical issues and the need for translational research. So we need to reconcile the contrary evidence and find out why. Um, part of consuming uh, research is to be aware of those methodological and analytical issues that could potentially lead to contrary results. For example, my work in um, peer intervention models. If you do a cursory review of the effectiveness of those models in children's mental health, you'll find that there's a vast um, diversity across studies regarding how outcomes are measured or what outcomes we're looking at. And that's problematic when you come up with contra contrary or mixed results because we don't know if it's because the intervention isn't effective um, or if there's something going on with that sample or is it the way that we're studying it. And so we really need to standardize and into the second point, um, use more rigorous research designs. We also need to really look at those therapeutic processes that impact access and engagement and care. And those include uh, relevance of perceived relevance of the treatment, satisfaction with services. Are the services addressing um, the need in the way in a way that I find to be acceptable as a client? Um, and tailoring treatments in a systematic way to meet the needs of individuals. Um, and this is, again, so complementary to the evidence-based practice model, where we consider the needs, the values, um, all of those processes when we are um, working with clients and using a particular therapeutic approach. All right, we're at the end of our slide deck. Next module is on autism spectrum disorders.